<sighs> okay, well, it's Saturday morning. Uh, it's about 10 after 9. So this is going to be day two. So this is going to be Tuesday morning when you all are seeing this. So let's kind of go over that uh, purple assignment that you all were given yesterday on Kepler's Laws. So let's do a quick summary of those laws. And first law was law of ellipses. So R star is one foci, goes around like this, boom, it's an egg shape. Not a big deal. So the second law is law of equal areas and equal times, and that's what the lab that we're going to do today. So what that says is that if you find some arbitrary period of time, 30 days, 20 days, whatever it is, and if you were to find the area swept out by that planet, in a certain amount of time, in, in say this 20 day period. And then if you were over here and you were to find that same 20 day period, those two areas would be equal. Now, because it's an ellipse, the radius is continuously changing. So to compensate for the shrinking radius when it's on the short side, it goes faster. So it travels a bigger part of the circle. When it's further away, it slows down. So it's not traveling as fast. Later on, we'll see how that plays out with energy, okay? So it has more kinetic energy, which is the energy of motion when it's closer, and it has more potential energy when it's further away. So it's almost kind of like stretching rubber band. Okay, so third law. This is the one that's mathematical. And this is the one we talked about where yesterday it's just a ratio. So you have the period of A squared over period of B squared equals RA cubed over RB cubed. Now, here's the unique thing about this. These are ratios. So the units don't make any difference, okay? Could be years. The, this radius could be in astronomical units. That's what Kepler worked off of. It could actually be in units of distance, like kilometers, meters, something like that. Period just a period of time. Could be years, could be days, could be hours, whatever it is. Because again, it's just a ratio. So this is, so this is the only time, listen to me, okay? Focus. Jack, focus, okay? This is the only time that I will ever tell you that it doesn't pay attention. The units don't make any difference at all, okay? Doesn't make any difference. They just have to be the same. The other criteria that has to be met is that these objects both have to orbit the same center. So like, for example, you talk about Mars and the Earth, but you could not talk about uh, a moon of Saturn and our moon because they don't orbit the same thing. Okay, so if you look on, like, for example, question number five. So let's make sure everybody's cool. So you're talking about Jupiter. Jupiter is 5.2 times further. So keep in mind, if you're Kepler, you didn't know the actual distances. He just knew that based upon his observations that Jupiter was 5.2 times further from the sun than the Earth was. So here's our star, here's the distance to the Earth, 5.2 times greater, there's Jupiter, okay? So what you're gonna try and figure out, okay, hey, what's gonna be the period of Jupiter? So you're going to have four variables. You're going to have the period of the Earth. You're going to have the period of Jupiter. You're going to have the radius of the Earth. You're going to have the radius of Jupiter. Now, Kepler didn't have Carson to sit there with a calculator and do the calculations for him. So he goes, man, this is horrible. What am I going to do? So he's going to use a numeric value of one every chance that he gets. He didn't know the distances anyway. So this is okay. I'm going to let the distance to the Earth be one astronomical unit. Okay? It's one. Boom. There you go. So that means the radius of Jupiter is going to be 5.20 AUs. Okay? 5.2 times greater. Period of the Earth, we could either use 365 days or one year. Oh, one's easier to work with. Okay, I'm going to let that be one year. Period of Jupiter, that's what I don't know. Now, you have to figure out that when you get this answer, 
it has to be bigger than one year because of the fact that Jupiter is further out in its orbit than the Earth is. So if you go with Kepler's third law, you go period of the Earth squared over the period of Jupiter squared is going to equal the radius of the Earth cubed over the radius of Jupiter cubed. Okay? Now, I hate fractions, so I'm going to cross multiply. So I'm going to have the period of the Earth squared times the radius of Jupiter cubed is going to equal the period of Jupiter squared times the radius of Earth cubed. Okay? So all I did was cross multiply. And then I have it like this. So I have four variables. Now, conveniently, the period of the Earth is going to be one year. Okay? So I don't have to worry about that. It's not zero. Okay? Don't think that, oh, that's zero. No, it's just it has a numeric value of one. The same thing over here with the radius of the Earth. That's just going to be one astronomical unit. Okay, cool. So then, this is what we're left with. So, you know that the radius of Jupiter is 5.20. So you're going to cube that, and then you're going to take the square root of that to get the period of Jupiter. And if you do that right, you should get about 12 years. Okay? So, if you like birthdays, don't live on Jupiter. Okay? Because you're only going to have a birthday every 12 years if you define a birthday as completing one track or one orbit around our star. So, if you like birthdays, mm, Jupiter is going to be a tough sell because you're gonna have, only going to have one every 12 years. But, so, just saying. All right. Uh, your answer to number six, this is an ish, should be around 10, okay, astronomical units. That means Saturn's even further out. Saturn's about 10 times further out. Uh, Venus's orbit, that should be around between 0.5 and 1. So your answer to number seven should be between 0.5 and 1. Uh, your answer to number eight should be something around your current age right now. Now, let's talk about number nine. So number nine, we're saying, here's our rock that we live on. Here's the satellite. And here's our moon. Okay, cool. So your satellite orbits about halfway between that between us and the moon. So there's a couple of things that you can do. First, realize you have to have four variables. You're going to have the period of the satellite. You're going to have the period of the moon. You're going to have the radius of the satellite. And you're going to have the radius of the moon. So those are going to be your four variables. So you're told that the radius of the satellite is half that of the moon's. So what you could do is you could let the radius of the moon be one instead of astronomical units. We're going to let that be one loop, one lunar unit of distance. We don't know what it is. We're just going to let it be one. Then you're going to let the radius of the satellite be 0.5 loops. There you go. Okay. That's one. The other one's going to be 0.5. Then... Now you have this situation. Well, here's the easiest thing to do because I tell you, you want to find the period of the satellite as a multiple of the moon's period. So just let the period of the moon be one lunar orbit, one low, okay? Again, it's just a ratio. So then you're going to let the period of the satellite be your unknown value. Now, you know when you get this answer, if you let the period of the moon be one, you know the period of the satellite has to be less than 1, okay? And again, this is a multiple, okay? That's all it is. So if you do this right at number 9, this is an ish, okay? But you're going to get something around 0.4. So that means the period of the satellite is about 0.4 times that of the moon's. So the beauty of this is, is that if you actually know the period of the moon, then to get the period of the satellite, you would take 0.4 times that numeric value. Boom, there you'd have the period of the satellite itself. So when you answer number nine, 
you want to say something like, oh, the period of the moon or the period of the satellite is like, for example, it's going to be about 0.4. It's not 0.4, but it's something close to that. So you say, oh, the period of the satellite is 0.4 times that of the moon's. Okay, now, I, I want to clarify one thing when you get to question number one. And I want to, because I got asked this by uh, a guy that's married to one of my nieces. And, and, and it was an odd question, but I want to make sure everybody's cool with this. So here's the sun. Here's our rock. And we are tilted, okay? About 23 and a half degrees. So let's say that I'm the sun. So the reason that we have seasons is not because the earth is closer or further away. The, we, we, the earth is in an elliptical orbit, but it's very slight, okay? It's not a huge elliptical orbit. So the reason that we have seasons is because the earth is tilted, okay? That's the only reason that we have seasons. Because if it was a function of how close we are to the sun, then the northern and hem southern hemispheres would all have summer at the same time, or we'd all have winter at the same time. The reason we have seasons is because of the tilt. So, like, here's, here we are in Mays, America. So, if this, this is going to be winter because we're tilted, we're tilted away from it, so the sunlight comes in at more of a glancing angle. So this is why it, the winter was called the season of the long shadows. Because of the fact that that light is coming in at an angle, you get longer shadows. Now, six months later, okay, now we're over here. So now, here we are in Mays, America. And now when that sun comes in, now it's at a much more direct angle. That's why it's warmer in the summer. So the reason that we have seasons is not because of the changing distance to the sun. It's because the earth is tilted on its axis. Okay, so that should give you enough information to get those done, get that handed in. Uh, then we're going to pass out. You're going to get three sheets of paper. So we need to make this happen. So you need to get, you should have, you're going to get this graph. We'll talk about all this in just a second. You're going to get this sheet of paper, have that. And then you're going to have this lab itself, the validation of Kepler's law. So right now, MLM, make sure that these all get passed out to everybody. Blue sheet, three white sheets. If you have your assignment done, you know the drill. Put that up into the tray. We'll stop this, and then we'll start so, the in just a second. Let me explain what you have. So I went ahead and plotted the points for you to kind of speed up the process. So what this does is this shows the path of Mercury as it goes around the sun over the course of one orbit. So sun's here. That's one foci. Notice that it's an elliptical orbit. This would be really simple to do if... Mercury traveled in a circular orbit because all you'd have to do is just take a compass, boom, draw a circle, all the points would be equal distance. But it's not. Pretty elliptical. So, what we're going to do is we're going to use this as a way of trying to validate Kepler's three laws. So, this is the sheet. So, what this gives you is the data that generated this graph. So, You've got the dates, then you've got the radius in astronomical units, not distances. These are going to be in AUs. And then it tells you the angle. So this is like a polar graph. So zero degrees is just like we've always done. That's that positive x-axis. And then all the angles are measured counterclockwise around like this. So what we're going to do, starting and stopping the video, is we're going to go through and see, hey, can we use this to validate Kepler's three laws? So it, already, it tells you to plot the points. We already have that done, so don't worry about that. So the very first question, it says, looking at your graph, does the orbit support Kepler's first law? Explain. Ah, let's see. Wow. It looks like an ellipse. Let's go with yes, it does, because it looks like an ellipse. 
Okay, not a squirrel, not a penguin. Okay, looks like an ellipse. Now, the second law. Now we're going to see if the math works. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at a series of three 10-day periods of time, and we're going to calculate the area that's swept out by them. So the first one, everybody's going to do the same one. So on this first one, we're going to go between December 20th and December 30th. Okay? All right? So come here, and you're going to find December 20th. Okay. At Dece on December 20th, it's 0 0.309 astronomical units. That's its radius. And then it's at an angle of 65 degrees. Then on December 30th, it's 0.327 AUs, and that's going to be 126 degrees. So what happened is that it went from here at 65 degrees, about right here, and then 10 days later, it's moved all the way over here to 126 degrees. So what we're going to do is a couple of things. What you need to do, because this is going to make it easier for me to grade, take a highlighter, take a pencil, do something, and I want you to box out December 20th and December 30th. So I want you to draw a box around those days. We're eventually going to do this with all three periods of time. This is just going to say, okay, hey, this is one of the times we're going to use December 20th through December 30th. So come over here. Here's your columns. Make a box around that that says, hey, this is going to be one of those 10-day periods. So now we need to figure out the area that was swept out. So on the sheet, right here, you have area equals theta over 360 times pi r squared. So we have area equals theta over 360 times pi r squared. So what the theta over 360 does, that's going to tell us what portion of the circle that we're using. So, like, if we wanted to find half the area, we'd use 180 over 360, because that would be half the area of the circle. If we wanted to do the entire circle, oh, well, that would be 360 over 360, otherwise known as 1, and then we would just do pi r squared. So the theta over 360 tells us how many degrees that sweeps out, and that's going to tell us how much of the circle that we're going to use. So, to get theta, we're going to take the change in the degrees. So, we're going to take 126 minus 65, and that's going to get us 61 degrees. So, right here where it says theta, we're going to put 61 degrees. Okay, so theta is going to equal 61 degrees. Now, the radius, we're going to use the average radius over this time period. But we're going to make this simple. Instead of adding together all 10 of them and dividing by 10, we're just going to take the average of the beginning and the average and then the, the other value at the end. So we're just going to have two. So what we're going to do, because I've got to do this on my own since none of you are here on a Saturday morning. Rude. God. Okay, so I'm going to take 0 0.309, and Carson, you can check me on this one. And we're going to add that to 0.327, and then we're going to divide that by 2, and we're going to get 0.318. So the radius is going to be 0.318 AUs, which is the average of these two numbers. Okay, so your radius is always going to be the average from the beginning to the end. So now, to find this area, we're going to take 61 over 360 times pi times this average radius of 0.318 AU, and then we're going to square that. Okay? So again, i got to do this on my own. So I'm going to take uh, 61 divided by 360 times pi times ah, 
I hate this calculator. 0.318 squared, and I get in scientific notation 5.38 times 10 to the minus second AU squared, okay? So this is going to be the same for everybody. So what you need to do is that you're going to take your graph, and this is, you're going to end up doing three different areas. The first area is going to be the same for everybody. So, and you, I've got colored pencils out. If you want to get, if you want to make them look nice, do colored pencils. If you just want to take a pencil and just shade it, that's cool, whatever you want to do. So what you're going to do is you're going to draw a line from the center out to the edge of the orbit on December 20th. And then you're going to do the same thing on December 30th. And then you're going to shade that in. The reason that I want you to do that is that when I go to grade these, then it makes it easier for me to see. So everybody's going to have the same thing on this first one. That way everybody's cool with what we got going. So when you get done with that, here's going to be the next step. You're going to pick two other 10-day periods, okay? I don't care which 10-day periods you pick. So you're going to come in here and maybe you want to go... Uh, October 9th through the 19th, or November 10th through the 20th. I don't care. But what you want to do is pick some areas that will get you spread out onto the different areas of the graph. So maybe pick one over here, maybe pick one over here. Be careful if you pick ones that go through zero like if you have one that's like at 355 degrees and then another one that's over on the zero side. You can do that, but you have to be careful about how you calculate that angle because you're crossing through zero. So here's what I want you to do. We're going to stop the camera for just a second. You're going to go through and you're going to find and pick those 10-day periods. So what you want to do is highlight on this sheet of paper, whichever 10-day periods that you pick. Again, because everybody's going to be picking different ones, okay? Lux is going to be different, is going to be picking different ones than Hector is, and Hector's is going to be different than Devon, Washington, D.C. when, okay? So everybody's is going to be different. So you want to make it easy for me when I get back and I go to grade these on Wednesday. So you want to highlight and box in those 10-day periods. So you're going to do that. Then you're also going to draw them on this graph. So, and you're going to shade these in. So when you get done, it's going to look like a, like, almost like a pinwheel. So the first one's the same. This purple region is the same. Everybody's is the same. You're going to pick the other 10-day periods. So what you're going to do here, back on the blue sheet, so you're going to say area two, from this date to this date, pick a 10-day period. Then the angles, okay, on that next line, on that calculation of theta, you're going to say something minus something equals something. That's how you're going to get your theta. Then radius one, whatever that is, plus radius two equals, add those numbers together. I'm going to take you through step by step by step. Then you're going to find the average radius, and then you're going to find the area. So you, when you calculate that area, you're going to do just like I did. You're going to write that in scientific notation. They all should be 10 to the negative second, and you're going to have units of AU squared. So everybody's going to go through, and you're going to, so the first one's the same. You're going to go through, you're going to highlight it on this sheet, the 10 day period, then you're going to show me the calculations here. And then when you get done, then over here on number eight, then you're going to calculate the average of those three. When you calculate the average, I know you all can add together and numbers and divide by three. You don't have to show me, oh, this plus this plus this divided by three. Just find the average of the three numbers. And hopefully your average is going to be something times 10 to the minus second. If your average isn't 10 to the minus second, 
and probably something around five, you've done something wrong. Okay, so let's go ahead and stop the video for just a second. I'm guessing it's going to probably take about 10 minutes for the kids to do this. When they get done, kind of everybody gets finished, we'll start the video back up again. So find the three, av three areas, find the average of those, okay, and we're back. So now we're ready for number nine. So what, what we're going to do on number nine is that we're going to see how close the values are to each other. So what you're going to do is you're going to take your answer from number eight, which is your average, x bar, x bar means average. And you're going to use that as the accepted value. I want to compare the areas to that. So, and again, everybody's is going to be different, okay? Everybody is going to be different. Tyler's is going to be different from Bailey's, which is going to be different from Mr. Fisher's, okay? They're all going to be different. So the only thing I can grade is your work. So what you're going to do, you're going to take your average, which is your answer from number eight, minus that first value. So everybody has that same first value, which is this 5.38 times 10 to the minus second. So you're going to take your average minus 5.38 times 10 to the minus second, and then you're going to divide that by the average. You're going to take the absolute value, and then you're going to multiply that by 100. Okay. So the only thing that's going to be different in this first calculation is your average, because everybody has that same first area of 5.38 times 10 to the minus second. So you take your average, okay, your answer to number eight, subtract 5.38 times 10 to the minus second, and then divide that by the average. So then on the other ones, you're going to take that same average minus whatever you got for area number two, whatever your 10-day period was, divide that by the average, and then you can take your average minus what you got for that third area, and divide that by the average, multiply that by 100, boom, times 100, okay? So what you should see is that your averages typically are around uh, three to five percent. If you have an average, if you have an experimental error, excuse me, your error is usually around three to five percent. If you have a ex huge experimental error, like, you know, 15, 20 percent, you did one of those calculations wrong on that 10-day period of time. So then on number 10, it says, do your results validate Kepler's second law? Hopefully they do. Hopefully you see that there's just a small amount of error or discrepancy between the three 10-day periods. Okay. Now, let's talk about number 11. So number 11, and this is going to be the same for everybody. We're going to find the average radius by finding the average of the smallest and the largest radius. So if you look through this data, and you go through here, and you'll see that the smallest distance is here on December 22nd, which is 0 0.30 seven. Okay, that's the smallest value. If you go through all of these, the smallest one is 0 0.307. Then the biggest one is out here at 0.467, okay, on November 8th, okay, plus 0 0.467. So we're going to take, we're going to find the average of those two. So we're going to pluck this in, plus 0.467, we'll divide that by two, and we get 0.387 AUs. So here's your answer to number 11. Okay, this is gonna be the same for everybody. Boom, here we go, okay? Now, when you get to number 12, now we're gonna see if this validates Kepler's third law. Third law is the law of the ratios, okay? So what we have is we have the period of Earth, period of Mercury, radius of the Earth, radius of Mercury, squared, squared, cubed, cubed. 
So we have four different variables. Because we're working in days, okay, because we're working in days, we're going to let the period of the Earth, okay, it be 365 days, and I tell you that in the instructions. So we're going to let this be 365 days. We're going to let the radius of the Earth be one astronomical unit, and we're going to let the radius of Mercury be 0.387. So the only thing we don't know is the period of Mercury. Now, the reason that we're, working, that we're going to work in days is because that's how this data is set up. It's going to be in days. So what you want to do is isolate this variable. Again, what I would do, I hate fractions, cross multiply. You have the period of the Earth squared times the radius of Mercury cubed is going to equal the period of Mercury squared times the radius of Earth cubed. Now, in this situation, we're not letting the period of the Earth be one year. You actually have to put in those 365 days squared. The radius of Mercury is going to be that 0.387. Now, we are going to let the radius of the Earth be one astronomical unit okay that is going to happen that is going to be one astronomical unit so what you need to do is solve for the period of mercury and you should see if you do this right that should be around 90 days okay that's an ish but it should be something around 90 days so do that we're going to stop the camera get that calculation now we done. need to see if that theoretical value actually matches the reality of what's going to take place. So on number 15, okay, so on number 15, you're going to figure out how many days it takes for Mercury to complete one orbit. So on your data sheet, this one, on October 1st, you're at 114 degrees. You need to figure out how many days it takes to get back to 114 degrees, okay? You go on counterclockwise. So you're at 114 degrees. Go through here, figure out when it gets back to 114 degrees. So we don't count the same day twice. This will make sense. It's going, it's going to take all of October. October technically has 31 days in it, but we, so we don't count the same day twice. Only count 30 days in October. So where you have here, okay, on the October days, put 30, okay? It's going to take all of November, and then you're going to figure out how many days in December it took to get that back to that point, and then you're going to add those together, and then you're going to compare your answer to number 13 to your answer to number 12. Hopefully you see that the two values are really, really close together. So that's going to be the next thing. So here's going to be your quote homework, okay? Over here on the Newtonian side of the lab, don't do the whole thing. The only thing I want you to do is up here on this very first one. That's the only thing I want you to do. You're going to go to your graph, okay? You're going to go to your graph. You're going to find two exact points. You're going to find the point where it's traveling fastest, which is going to be the point where it's closest. You're going to find the point where it's going slowest. That's when it's furthest away. And then in between those two points, it's going to be speeding up or it's going to be slowing down. So here's going to be your graph. Okay. So you are going to look through the data. Okay. And you're going to find that point where it has its absolute closest radius. Okay. Wherever that is. And you're going to say, okay, when it's closest, that's when you say, okay, this is when you have your largest velocity. That's when it's going fastest. Out here, you're going to find the point when it's furthest away. That's going to have its slowest velocity. Then, in between, this is when you are going from your fastest to the slowest. So you're going to shade that region, somehow mark that and say, this is when we're slowing down. 
and then you're going to have the other region where it's speeding up. So Mercury is going to spend half of its orbit slowing down, half of it speeding up. So when you get done, okay, you're going to have something like this. You're going to have the single point. It's going to be somewhere up here where it's going fastest. You're going to have a point down here where it's going slowest. Then it's going to either be speeding up or slowing down, and you want to shade that in. So when you get done, this is where you're going to stop. You're going to stop it up there on number one over here on page three. So when you get done, here's what I should see. Your three shaded regions, which has the three 10-day periods. The single point where it's going fastest, the single point where it's going slowest, the region where it's speeding up, and the region where it's slowing down. Okay, kids, get all that done. Uh, unless my flight gets delayed, which hopefully does not happen, I will see you all tomorrow morning, uh, and then we'll finish this up. So you don't have any homework. We will finish this lab up tomorrow in class. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day.